بسم الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ویلکم آڈینس ٹو نو دا ایپیسوڈ آف دا ٹوک ان دی پوڈکاسٹ آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ ماجد اینڈ ٹوڈے آئی ہیو مائی کا ہوسٹ برادر راش السلام علیکم لیٹ ریسپانس اینڈ آلسو ا اسپیشل گیسٹ ریٹرن آف برادر ڈینیل حقیق جو السلام علیکم Walaikum salam brother Daniel uh pleasure mashallah to have you back on the show Yeah pleased to be here Subhanallah subhanallah so um so yeah bro uh obviously we did a podcast last time about um uh, quarantine talking the in quarantine of the situation in the UK but uh, tell us what's happening in the US then at the moment in regards you- to uh, COVID-19 Yeah, in the US, it depends on what state you're in. So I'm in Texas, the cowboy state. And cowboys, you know, they aren't really very afraid of viruses, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't been locked down. But uh, other places, it's complete lockdown. You can't go outside without police stopping you and asking you if you're a part of an essential business or not. Mm. So, so it's not even... So the it's actually that's not even a uh, that's not even a partial lockdown is it really Well all the um businesses are closed um when it comes to the message like there's no gatherings there can't be any gatherings of more than mm-hmm. five people uh, Okay so that yeah so we can't really there's no juma um and even the sala like a lot of places they just closed So Yeah, that's what we have to deal with. Uh there's still grocery stores that people can go to. Mm-hmm. And there there's still food on the shelves. It's not like everything's been emptied out. Uh so alhamdulillah that and then parks if you drive outside because everywhere is closed, all of the walking trails in the parks are packed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's actually it's actually strange because uh these parks and maybe it's because the weather has been nice recently alhamdulillah but you have a lot of people just walking outside and i guess it's because the gyms have been closed so they can't mm. go on the treadmill mm. they're just walking outside and i don't think they're abiding by the distancing social distancing because the trail is like a walking path and you're going to walk across people so yeah i think similar has been happening here maybe it's down to the fact that people you know are, get, are now appreciating that you need to get out and get some fresh air and being stuck at home isn't all that convenient but what i found amusing comparing your situation and ours is over here in the uk what is essential is toilet paper and what is essential in america seems to be guns so <laughs> that that comparison made me made me laugh actually yeah yeah a lot, a lot of the people gun- went and went and yeah. bought some guns ammo and mm. so generally i mean the the, the people there cuz cuz here there's like in america it's so big obviously like you said is is going to be based on the state you're in uh, which you know which part of america you're in but in the uk uh it's it's the same all, all across and and a lot of people subhanallah a lot of people are um going mad at home you know and um it, it's just goes to show subhanallah there's many things that we take for granted um like just walking in the park <laughs> nobody wants to do it everyone wants to drive even people want to drive around to you know a corner shop but uh when the opportunity is not there then you know subhanallah people regret but in in the US how did or just say in the state of Texas how did people muslims respond to like the the juma band and the the, the masjids being closed did people understand that or was were people angry or Uh you know I think here there wasn't much uh pushback you know I think people just and there's like a overarching committee uh in the city that I'm in that makes those decisions for all of the masajid pretty much or the majority of them so in my area there wasn't much pushback it was maybe even they were preempting any kind of government restriction and closing things down ahead of time that what was even necessary so you know that's their decision i guess they had the reasons for that and how they approached it but i mean what's what's your personal opinion on that anyway i mean did, were you were you for the uh for the the the, the stopping of juma salah or well you want my, you know my perspective on everything yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'll be 
<laughs> okay, but I mean, people get really angry. Like you can't even uh, talk about this openly. And I feel like there's a, a situation where there's just mass hysteria. Mm. And, um, you know, I've done research. I have many friends who are doctors. Um, some of them are at hospitals. And it's uh, their opinion is that, look, this is just the flu. And we have flu season every year. And we have infection rate, we have hospitalization, we have death toll every single year. And this is nothing out of the ordinary. This is nothing out of the ordinary. And um, I think that if you, any kind of, uh, like if you look at any kind of cause of death, if you're reporting on it every single day, like, oh, another person died of cancer, mm -hmm. the cancer death toll is rising. Or, you know, the heart disease death toll is rising. We're at, it's only March or it's only April and we're already at half a million deaths mm. from, if every day that was happening, then people would get really scared. Mm. And I don't think they're, you know, whether this is a mass conspiracy or not, I don't know. I think there's definitely some people, powerful people who are taking advantage and are benefiting from this situation. It's been an opportunity to consolidate a lot of power uh, there's in the U.S. There's been trillion dollar bailouts. Yeah, you know, bailing out of major corporations and banks. Like, why? Why would they need to get uh, those trillions of dollars if it's a issue of lack of hospital resources, medical resources? Then shouldn't they be getting <laughs> bailed out? Shouldn't they? Shouldn't they be injected with the with the capital to be able to expand resources because they're quote unquote overrun? That's supposed to be the whole whole reason for the lockdown is because we don't want to overrun the medical establishment or the medical system. Well, if that's the case, why can't that infra infrastructure be expanded through an injection of billions of dollars in capital? It's, it seems like a very simple question, mm. but you have uh, people taking advantage uh, at the highest levels. And as Muslims, like we should be very conscious of the fact when there is this kind of consolidation of power, and you have different governments who are instituting huge restrictions on people, like whether it's justified or not, put that question to the side. Um, the fact of the matter is there are huge restrictions uh, on people throughout the world. And there are systems that are being put in place to effectuate that, such as surveillance, face recognition, mm -hmm. all of these technologies um, that were either being used quietly or they hadn't been adopted yet. Now they're being adopted, now they're being implemented and it's all on this basis of quote unquote public safety. Mm. So a lot of money is going into that kind of technology and the governments are actually using it to control and to monitor. And as Muslims, we have to be very concerned about this because we're uh, this, you know, as sad as it may be, the world is controlled by non-Muslims who are very antagonistic, many of them to Islam. Yeah. And that's what we've seen uh, for, you know, at a heightened level for the past 20 years with the war on, quote unquote, war on terror. So this is just another step. Like I, I look at what's happening right now uh, as very parallel to what happened after 9-11 with the kind of massive changes that came and the entire globe shifting in terms of a response to what was, what is this made up boogeyman of terror like we're all going to die we're all we all need to be uh, uh, you know monitored and every communication needs to be data mined by the government and we need to have all of these restrictions on people's lives um that that came after 9-11 it's just been increasing since then this is now another catalyzing event that people are taking advantage of governments are taking advantage of uh, we have to be, as believers, aware of these global trends because, you know, first of all, the believer should be informed uh, and should know what his enemies are doing. Subhanallah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, you know, the believer is not stung from the same home, same hole twice. So, um, so yes, yeah, so interesting views. And to be honest with you, um, they are, uh, I spoke to a lot of people and a lot of people who, do keep up with you know what's happening politically around the world and you know there's a lot of question marks i think one thing is is what what we see is and this is what happened after 9 11 as well is that what happens is 
you you get some people who come out with uh, maybe you know absurd theories as an example and what happens is they're labeled as conspiracy theories and then slowly anyone who has a different view an opinion than what the official narrative is is thrown into that same basket with the with the views which are you know just just not correct and hence why people even they, even if they do have an opinion sometimes they they resist from speaking out, speaking you know their their mind because of the fact that they will be seen as conspiracy theorists and looney tunes but you know like you're saying subhanallah there's many people that are saying that a lot of the laws that are being brought in now you know who's to say that once this you know pandemic uh, disappears that they're going to reverse on on many of these laws whether it's to do with face recognition or uh, in certain countries they're tracing people via their mobile phones um, but the one thing that people may counter is the fact that um, economically, you'd have to you'd have to agree economically the West is taking taking a hit. Now it may well be that you know the the situation is there, and they are t- they are there are forces that are taking advantage of it. Um, but generally, you know, if someone was to to argue that. You know, if the economy of Britain is hit, the economy of America is hit. For example, you know, the, for the capitalists, capital is the is, is their is their god. You know, why would they um, do something which is going to you know hit their pocket? What would you What it, would you say to that? It's not hitting their pocket. It's hitting the what's who's being hit are the people, the average people. Uh, the middle class and the lower classes, they're the ones who are getting hit. Uh, it's not the top of uh, the, the real capitalists. Yeah. Not, uh, Jeff Bezos, president of Amazon, he's not getting, founder of Amazon, he's not getting hit. He's, he's making a killing. Yeah, they had to hire thousands of employees because of the situation with everyone ordering on things online. Um, these banks that are receiving bailouts trillions of dollars, literally trillions, the biggest government bailouts um, in history are happening right now. This is benefiting them. It's benefiting them and it's hurting everyone else, the people who are losing their jobs. And the way that economists talk about market crashes is they talk about a reset. They talk about a reset. And it's a very uh, suspicious term that they use because it makes it seem like, okay, this is something that is going to have an overall benefit. Uh, when in, for many people, when economic crashes happen, such as what happened in 2007, 2008 with the housing market crash in the United States, um, you have people losing their homes, losing their jobs, yeah. going into bankruptcy. It's not a reset for them, that's the end. Uh, but for those who have capital, um, yes, they might have a loss uh, in that year financially, uh, but everything is cheaper for them. Everything is cheaper and they have the capital to be able to buy up everything that everyone else has to sell in order to make ends meet. So I'll give you an example. If you are just an average middle class and you have stocks and you're buying, like you have enough disposable income because the economy is in a good situation, you have your job, you've been saving, you have enough disposable income to buy stocks. So the prices of stocks are going up. Uh, Maybe you have enough money to buy property, to rent or to sell or whatever. Like you're in the middle class, but now you're having access to these kinds of other financial avenues. But when the financial crisis hits, you don't have all of this cushion that will protect your assets. Uh, If you lose your job, you have to start liquidating. You have to start selling things off. You have to start giving away the property and at a very cheap price. But those who have the capital, uh, because they're millionaires, this they love this kind of opportunity because everything is cheaper now. You can start buying stocks for for pennies on the dollar. You can start buying property, right? And I know, like I know Muslims who are very wealthy, and they will say that we're just waiting for the next market crash. They see it as an opportunity because <laughs> everything is cheaper, and then we're going to be able to uh, these, you know, instead of paying 100k for this flat or this um you know townhouse we'll we'll only have to pay half of that or 70 percent of that so it's much more profitable uh even though like it's a technically a market crash so whenever these market crashes happen there is a huge transfer of wealth up 
mm. actually. And the it's the government, because of corruption, that is bankrolling that because the government bails out. So everyone is suffering the loss, but certain people have the privilege of getting a check <laughs> from the government uh, for billions and billions and trillions of dollars. And where is the government getting that money? Uh, they're getting it from printing it. They're just they're just printing that money, and who ultimately has to front that cost? It's uh, it's the people because of inflation. The value of that dollar plummets. So I go to the grocery store instead of paying three dollars for milk for a liter or two liters of milk, I have to pay uh, six dollars or seven dollars or eight dollars. Cost of everything goes up, but my salary stays the same. Exactly. The, so the who employer. does that benefit? The, that benefits my employer. <laughs> that Definitely. Employer, right? Yeah. The, the point I'd like to make where well, I think I agree with Daniel in this respect is that sometimes, you know, they say it's called trickle down economics. This yeah. is a perfect example of all the bailout money. And this is what I've been thinking quite a bit recently is all that bailout money, even if it goes into the hands of some of the middle class and the lower class, that money then is going to them to be able to pay their rent, their mortgages, those inflated prices. What happens? That wealth just trickles back up to those people who have already got the wealth in their hands. It's not as if they're saying, well, for the next six months, you don't need to pay your rent. You know, we're going to let you off because there's, you know, those who have all the wealth at the top, um, they're going to fund you for the next six months because you guys are in in a difficult situation instead it's the case of going okay here you go here's some printed money but it will trickle back up to us because with that money you'll be paying your your mortgages and your rent and and the those inflated prices so in that respect i agree i think sometimes these kind of bailouts and these huge economic changes um people assume and certainly here in the uk People have said, well, look, the government's being quite generous. Yeah. They are paying people 80% of their salary. All the of government the paying that? Yeah, that's... the government are saying oh, yeah. here, as <laughs> well, long as it's better than our situation. Up to, up to two and a half thousand pounds a month, they will pay 80% of that. But the way I look at it is when they're paying that, that money is still trickling back up because the alternative would be to say, make lots of people bankrupt, less allow lots of houses to be repossessed. And in the long term, that is not beneficial to the economy anyway. So yeah. firstly, I think that's, that's an interesting point. Um, just very quickly, my view on the, the numbers, you know, one thing, this is why I do think the, the, um, the death numbers are a little bit suspect, which is where I think I agree with you, Daniel, is that, they are trying to, you know, when you said about the flu, um, yeah. one element I agree and the other element I don't perhaps, so I'll, I'll mention that as well. The bit I agree is the number of deaths now, especially in the UK, the deaths that were happening anyway, people that were dying anyway, if they have the, the COVID-19 virus, it's getting put under the tally of this person died from COVID-19 or it's, it's being conflated into that bucket. Whereas the fact that some people possibly would have died anyway, that bucket isn't being, you know, the, the, the comparison is not, is not relevant, is that, you know, a similar number of people at the moment at least are dying and they're putting it down to this particular virus. So that element, I think a lot of people have jumped onto that and have said there's an element of a conspiracy here. Um, maybe it's not as bad as, or sorry, it's only like another flu. Where I slightly, that bit I agree with. I think that the government are trying to... It's not, it's not like people, random people are saying this. These are doctors no, no. who are pointing out these discrepancies. Definitely. Practicing Definitely. doctors, and there are many online. It's not like tinfoil wearing, uh, basement yeah. dwelling, whatever. Conspiracy theorists. It's, these, these are doctors who are noting the discrepancies that, for example, in Italy, uh, where um, you find a lot of people who have died from corona or covid that whatever as you mentioned like they might have died from uh heart disease heart or just from mm. old age or something mm. from pneumonia but they just happen to have covid uh, yeah. covid and it's mm. counted as okay you've died from covid as COVID, opposed yeah. to you just had it 
So exactly. that's a big discrepancy. And the other discrepancy is that the way that they're calculating the death rate is not consistent. When it comes to fl other strains of flu, um, you have the calculation of a projection. Who are, what is the total number of people in the population who actually have this virus? Mm -hmm. And then based on that, you calculate, okay, how many ha have been hospitalized and then how many have died? And that's how you get a death rate. Yeah. But that's not the way that they're calculating the death rate for COVID. They're saying that these are the people that we've tested that are tested positive for COVID. And, probably and then these how many the, died. In the hospitals, yeah. They're yeah, only, only in the hospital. In the hospital. Yeah, so the, you have no, they have no sense other than I think South Korea has done the test, like a random sample. But yeah. I'm not even sure about that. But nowhere else have they done a random sample to see how many people can we project actually have it within the population? Because that's a bigger number. That's a much bigger number than the actual people who have tested positive for it. So if you have that bigger number and X number of people have died, then the the death rate is going to be much lower than what they've actually been saying and projecting. Yeah, so those are the two elements I agree. And I think that there is a bit of an agenda behind both of those using numbers and statistics to conflate things and, and create that hysteria. The bit that I'm not sure about, and maybe you can shed some light on it, is certainly the, over here in the UK and places like I've heard from people in Italy and you know you have these doctors doing WhatsApp videos and things like that. Certainly a lot of people have been saying that the health services have been massively over overwhelmed so regardless of number of deaths the actual number of people extra people in hospital certainly that is significantly or from what i can see Here. more than a common flu that that's the bit that anybody who comes along with a, a theory that it's not as it's similar to a flu that's the bit that i'm not quite sure about because certainly let me let me respond to that yeah let me respond to that just do do me a favor do a google search yeah um, flu, uh, hospitalization, hospitals overrun, hospitals overwhelmed uh, with flu, some, mm. some combination of those search terms. Go to Google News mm. and look at the news for any year, any year at all, yeah. uh, other than 2020, and you'll see the same headlines. Yeah. Because every year there are hospitals are overrun with flu. If there's a particularly bad flu season, hospitals are overrun. You have tents being set up in the parking lots. You have mm. overflow. This is a common annual occurrence. Mm. So just do me a favor. Just Google that. And yeah. Google's uh, news uh, search allows you to select dates. Go to any other year and you will see the same exact headlines. Yeah. No, no, I have seen some of that. So I don't think that's a misnomer. I think that is correct. I think what will be interesting is some people are, are brandishing numbers about at the moment, which shows that even the UK compared to one of its worst years of flu, that actually this year is quite typical. It's not a lot worse. However, up to now, the stats that I've seen have only included data up until about three weeks ago. And really, the numbers in the UK really started to increase in the last three or four days. So I'd personally like to see the numbers probably in a couple of weeks time and then do a, a bit of a comparison. But again, the thing is, are, Rush, yeah, also, go on. So the thing is, is it, with, the, with the hospitals, you know, there's one report, I can't remember where, where I read it, but it was saying that there's sections of the hospital now that have been, like, the beds have been reserved for people who are, mm -hmm. who would come in with COVID-19. So there's no one actually occupying those beds. They just reserved. So automatically for certain section is reserved for this, for these four people with COVID-19, anyone else coming with anything else, they're going to have a problem. So you can see why there's, is going to look like as if, the NHS is struggling, which they are, and that's not because just of COVID nineteen. That's because of, you know, underfunding years, and years of austerity, of, of, of austerity, underfunding. Exactly, but there's there's another thing where um, I can you know just mention so there were Muslims where Muslims have passed away, and what the doctors of the coroners have said is, look, you know, um, mm. we will label this person as dying from COVID nineteen. Or you wait around, I think it was six weeks or maybe longer for us to do an autopsy when we get the time. Yeah. And, you know, so obviously as Muslims, we know we need to bury the, the deceased as soon as possible. So most people are saying, fine, that's right. Just, just 
just put it down as COVID-19. And the point Daniel made is a fantastic point that does when someone dies, are they dying with COVID-19 or because of COVID-19? And I think that's something which uh, these stats don't reflect. And, and also, if you're looking at the, the people at the hospital, the nurses, and you know some of the horror stories you hear where people are having to work 48 hours you know, nurses off working straight on 40 hours. So when someone dies, do they really have that time to be able to diagnose every single person? It's easy. It's just convenient. I'm not saying this in a bad way, but to say, yes, you know, this was COVID-19 was the, was the reason why uh, this person died. So, uh, so certainly there's a question mark. And, you know, it's one of those things that some people will, will disagree but I think, you know, uh, the, the point that, that Daniel made, I think it, it's when you look at the numbers, when you look at the box, when you move away from the national TV, and, you know, for example, Boris Johnson is, you know, it's convenient that he has it, the health minister has it, and he's telling everyone to stay home. That is kind of... It's amazing how all of these celebrities <laughs> and politicians all got it. And they and are taking quickly. like... Yeah, they get tested and then they do like, they go on social media to announce it. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. Well, this is the thing. This is where I think some Muslims need to be a bit more aware because there's some that will just shout that this is conspiracy, but they should recognize the fact that those people in power, like you said, Daniel, are willing to carry out these type of maneuvers. They know when, you, when hysteria happens and the masses actually seek for law changes and for things to be altered for them. They're actually seeking their oppression and their suppression. That's when these kind of laws come into place. And we've, we've seen that historically, but unfortunately there are a lot of people who will just say it's a conspiracy theory. And for it, I don't know why Muslims would, would like have this kind of attitude of mm. being anti-conspiracy. All conspiracy means is that you have a group that is acting maliciously in secret against others. That's all a conspiracy is. All Muslims are conspiracy theorists in the sense that we think, we believe in shaitan. Yes, <laughs> we believe that there are dark forces that are working secretly out of the uh, out of uh, view of people against the interests of, of humanity and the believers. So we're the biggest conspiracy theorists by virtue of believing that. Uh, so I don't, I don't get the mentality that we have, we should have this trust with authority. And when it comes to medical establishment, look, I'm not saying everything that's coming from medicine is false, but everything requires a critical eye and a critical mind. Just because it's coming from an authority does not make it so correct. And when it comes to medical research, there is, uh, meta studies that have shown um, one famously from John Ioannidis from Greece, where he shows that 50% of medical research results are not reproducible. You cannot reproduce, uh, you, they, stu they study some medical phenomenon, they, they do an experiment, they get results, and they publish those results in peer-reviewed academic medical journals. And this researcher went and did a meta study. He evaluated all of these different studies. Um, he limited himself to the top most cited studies. And he found that m oh, half of them could not be reproduced. The experimental results <laughs> could not be re reproduced. These are medical, medically sound, quote unquote, published in peer reviewed journals. Another more uh, maybe common example that we can appeal to is uh, I, I, I posted this on Twitter, actually, and sarcastically, and a lot of people didn't get the joke that I was trying to make. <laughs> but I posted, I posted the food pyramid. Are you familiar with the food pyramid? The classical, uh, where it shows you your, how much of your diet should come from uh, yeah. grains versus yeah, vegetables, yeah. meat, dairy, and fat, yeah. and yeah, sugar. Same. And you'll see the bottom of that pyramid is 40% of the diet recommended is coming from carbs. Bread, mm. cereal, pasta, rice, yeah. and this and, and the uh, recommendation from the medical establishment as well as the FDA uh, in the U.S. and throughout the world was that you need to have mostly carbs and you need to limit the amount of fat and protein that you're getting. And the entire food pyramid was based on this, and it turned out to be completely wrong. <laughs> and mm. it was actually the exact opposite that people need to reduce the amount of uh, 
uh, processed carbohydrates that they're taking, particularly bread, pasta, cereal. They need to e decrease the amount of sugar that they're having. Fat is actually healthy if, you, if it's from a healthy source. Mm. So the medical uh, establishment has made a complete 180 degree turn in recent years, but for decades, they're giving the complete wrong what advice that, that, that has contributed to the death of, of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, because of heart disease, diabetes, and these kinds of problems. So I joke that anyone, have you heard of the keto diet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I joke like, okay, any Muslim that's following the keto diet, you're going against the expert advice that was given yeah. for a decade. So you're a conspiracy theorist if you think that these doctors were all colluding and conspiring to make people uh, fat and to die of heart disease, mm. right? That's the implication. So if we can understand how a professional group or authority, uh, especially tied to the government, can be very wrong. In fact, be get it exactly wrong, the opposite. The opposite, yeah. Then okay, that that's that should be part of our understanding of the world. That we can't just trust whoever has that authoritative badge that says this is the case. Mm. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. We have to evaluate and have that critical mind. And this is something that uh, Allah tells us in the Quran that if a fasiq comes to you. Uh, a fasiq yeah. means someone who's an evildoer, someone who is has a habitually is doing wrong, comes to you with news, then verify it, mm -hmm. right? So this is <laughs> the, the, these authorities, these governments that are coming with this uh, dogma. Okay, they're they're the definition of fasiq, <laughs> yeah. of, of being these fasiq uh, people, yeah. and so we have to have that. We have to follow what Allah says in the Quran and confirm and evaluate. And alhamdulillah, that's what people are doing. A lot of Muslim doctors, as I mentioned, I know, they say that this is completely overboard. Uh, this is not as dangerous. The infection rate, the death rate is nowhere near. It can't be what they're saying because the way they're calculating is, is wrong and inconsistent. Mm -hmm. um, it should at most, like what we would recommend as, as medical doctors, is that, okay, I distribute masks and people in crowded places just need to ha have that mask as long as they're healthy. If they're at risk, they're, they're older, or they have other kinds of medical conditions, then stay at home and avoid contact. But we don't need to lock down an entire country and destroy the economy and cause all, you know, Allah knows what kind of destruction. We haven't even tasted. We don't know what's going to happen. Only, only Allah knows what's going to happen in a month or two months because the effects of what is happening today, it's going to take us a while to realize the impact of it, to really feel the tangible uh, pain that has been caused, like millions of people out of work. So those millions of people are suffering. They're going to need to find work. They're going to fall. Many of them will have to fall into crime. They'll have to resort to crime, mm -hmm. violence, drugs. Like this is this is what's going to come for us. You know, well, also uh, we're we're viewing it from the point of view of the West, isn't it? Just a very quick point is that speaking to people in like Bangladesh, India, and places like that, where the government isn't at least giving a degree of support, there's a lot of people in poverty. All of a sudden, they can't ride their rickshaws, they can't, you know, do manual labour because all of a sudden there's nobody wanting to come out and and take those services. All of a sudden they were hand to mouth, you know, they, they didn't have the earnings to go beyond a couple of days. Those people are suffering so badly that these kind of measures, for them, the measures are far, 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 far worse than, the, than catching the virus itself. Um, so there's, you know, there's another perspective from the, a third world point of view, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's very dangerous and, and a big problem. If you look in India, for example, in India, at 8 o'clock p.m., they were told that at 12 o'clock, there's going to be a lockdown, mm. you know, and that's a proper lockdown. You're not leave, allowed to leave your home. And what, what chance did people have to, to, to get things? I mean, in Italy, they're talking about in places, there's going to be riots and, you know, because people are now actually starving. And, and also you, you've got other situations where, you know, and it's a good point that Daniel makes that, you know, we even not just the economic point of view or the fact that people are struggling, but, you know, if you look at the plots, of the of the kuffar against the muslims around the world these are not going to stop because of uh, coronavirus right so there's reports that you know uh, israel is implementing the deal of the century right now 
in West Bank and these areas. Mm. You know, Masjid al Aqsa is closed. You know, you don't know what's happening there. Kashmir has been closed since last August. Now that all this issue that was going on with the Muslims, you know, also the fact that they're blaming the Tablighi Jamaat, and whether it's true or not, but they're blaming Tablighi Jamaat in Delhi for being the main spreaders of this virus is convenient. That you, you know, so there's there's games being played. And, and, and the point is, is that right now everyone's just worried about themselves and toilet paper. But the reality is, is that I think when we're going to look about, look back at the coronavirus and what it meant, we're not, we're not going to see that now. Maybe next year, maybe year after. I don't know, Allah Wallam, but there are things that are being hatched right now. The world hasn't stopped. The uh, shaitan hasn't stopped because of coronavirus, right? You know, and I think that's one thing that we, we, we should appreciate. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. But also, you know, subhanAllah, speaking to Brother Daniel and, you know, uh, we could continue uh, for ages because, you know, it's always the, the, the views that, that you have really are one which enlighten. And I mean that as, as a really, you know, as a compliment because a lot of people, you're seeing now a lot of Muslims, what the messages you're receiving on WhatsApp, they, they, they're still very individualistic. I.e., for example, you know, you just make the dua for yourself and your family. You know, it's really disconnecting from, from the ummah as such. It's just about you now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in all this, and, and the reason, one of the reasons why I want to speak to Daniel and bring him on this podcast really was that um, there is a lot of uh, Muslims out there who now, because of lockdowns, they are at home now. And they have an opportunity, especially with, with the younger children, okay, uh, with the younger children, a lot of people are, are asking, you know, uh, now that we have this opportunity, everyone normally at work and stuff like that, now that the younger children are there, uh, how best to teach them Islamically, um, how best to culture them and take advantage of the fact that now they're out of the system to some extent. And the reason, obviously, you know, Brother Daniel and, and Brother Daniel's wife is also involved in the, the teaching side of things. So I want to get your view on this, uh, Brother Daniel, i.e. in regards to in a practical way, because a lot of people are asking, a lot of parents are asking, and they don't know whether it's just about the, the children reading Quran for 15, 20 minutes. You know, what, how can they take advantage of the fact that they do have access to their children now more than before, where it's just a case of dropping off at school, going to work, they come back, you get about an hour, they go to sleep, and it's very limited. So, so what are your views, what are your thoughts on this? I think that everyone has to make an effort uh, as parents. Um, you have to make an effort to connect with your children. And that's the main thing, like depending on how old, how old they are, just being uh, in their uh, face-to-face, talking with them, asking them about their day, their interests. That is a big uh, achievement. If you can do that on a daily basis, basis with your children, um, and being having the power to shut off the TV, having the willpower, just just turn off the TV, and don't use that as a crutch, okay? Um, because if you have that TV on, it's going to suck all the attention. Uh, in the room, it's going to people are distracted, or if they they have their phone in their hand, that's just an attention uh, suck that will uh, take away all of the possibilities of conversing having a conversation playing games uh because reciting quran practicing quran praying together that's all important and you should take advantage of this opportunity uh to go back and connect with the quran and but there's you know you can only do that for so many uh so much time a day Mm -hmm. and you have to also have fun you also have to play you have to um all kinds of games puzzles drawing feeding into their creativity so with our children we like to just give them pieces of paper and a pen and then whatever they want they can draw they can practice writing um they're younger but i you know this would apply to kids of any age just being able to have quality time Uh, board games can be very fun for the family to play that uh, together um, it's also important to get out. So I don't know if it's com- you can't even go to the park. You can't even walk over there in UK. And you can go to the park, but they like you say, it's not as seen as family day out park. It's more seen as <laughs> just go for a walk to get your daily half an hour of exercise and you can only go once and you should sure. stay in numbers of less than less than three. 
Yeah. So you can go like for a walk with your children mm -hmm. and that in itself has a lot of benefits, um, enjoying the scenery and you don't get to do that in the hustle and bustle of, um, work life and, mm -hmm. and student life. So there are many ideas and my wife wrote an article, um, on muslimskeptic.com uh, with five different ideas for what you can do with your children. Um, so her name is Um Khalid and um, you can go to muslimskeptic.com, skeptic spelled with a K and uh, that article is there on the front page. But yeah, and one of the things I think that Muslim parents will realize or recognize is that when their parent, when um, their children are not in school, especially if they're putting their kids in public school, but even some Islamic schools, their behavior is going to improve uh, at home. And that's because they don't have a bad influence uh, as much um, w bad friends, bad peers. So parents might notice that, oh, my child is behaving much better, much more respectfully. I'm able to connect uh, with him or her at, uh, to a larger degree. And the reason for that is he's not connected to the bad influences that he might have been around or just the environment of the public school as an institution. He's not, he's no longer in that and the behavior has improved. I mean, you know, to be honest with you, the, that's the, the point you make about the building, the connection, I think, you know, in the West certainly, and, I think that's something which which is lacking, and that's mainly because of the of time. You know, uh, you you know, you see many cartoons where, you know, there's a the, the the father comes home, and the child wants to talk or play, and then mm. they're like, look, you know, I'm I'm too busy, come back afterwards, or whatever, and then later on in life, when the you know when they're now teenagers, and um, they wanna the parents wanna speak to the teenagers, and they're like, look, you know, we don't have we we ain't got time, we don't want to speak to you, you're not cool. And I think that's really important because especially, you know, with the, you have um, like the su uh, subcontinent culture, whether it's Bangladesh or whether it's, whether it's pa Pakistan. And, you know, there's, there's always where, where the elders, you know, they were working in the factory, especially, you know, I'll give my own example, you know, father was working in the factory and stuff like that. And he was in school, you know, and they worked, you know, all the hours that, you know, Allah could send and, you know, and what it is, is there's a, a big, you know, a gap in, in that relationship. And also the relationship is very, where it's not, you know, it's not friendly as such. I'm not, I don't mean it's bad, but it, there's, there's not, not an element of, of friendship. You know, just like you're saying, like just sitting down, how things, how things go in and how are you and this and that, you know, it's more like, you know, go and do this and, and go and do that. And, you know, and I think that's, that's a really important point. I think that's even more important than just say, the Quran aspect because what it does do if it takes the kids out of that crowd where there's that rebellious streak you know and, and it's and it's you know uh, anyone who's doing good in education they're seen as a nerd is it's, 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 you know it's good to be like a rebel if they are that that sort of atmosphere then I think like you just said that the best advice really is is just try to build that relationship um, and that's I think first and foremost and, and I can take that on board myself to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, it's a relationship that is a parent child relationship. That's important because you can't really be as a parent, the friend of your child. It really depends on the age. Um, and there's, uh, you know, a certain ages where friendship makes sense. Um, after the age of 14, uh, 14 to 21, Mm -hmm. is the age of companionship and then beyond yeah. that and this is coming actually from a statement that is attributed to the sahaba um, but it's coming like from prophetic guidance uh, i believe it was ali yeah. who stated like this distinction that from ages uh, zero to seven that's the age of play then ages seven to 14 that's the age of discipline and then ages 14 and, and 21 and above that's companionship companionship so you can't really be a friend and a disciplinarian at the same time <laughs> <laughs> right uh so but i mean that's i think that there's a lot of wisdom in that advice you can have regardless of what stage in life your child is at you should always have a good connection with them where they feel comfortable talking to you about what they feel 
and you are there to listen, they, they don't feel like you're ignoring them or they're not important or they never get the feeling that you don't really love them. Um, that's, that's very important uh, to make sure your child knows how much you love him or her and that you're always open to listen to what he has to say. Um, and that doesn't mean that if he doesn't deserve a smack on the head, <laughs> you won't give it to him, but <laughs> uh, you're still open and you're uh, communicative with him. Do you know what I find quite interesting about this situation? You know, like the, you know, the Western family structure. I think people Muslims should reflect on this a little bit because it's the Western family structure that has promoted this idea of mother and father both going to work, not being that, you know, you know, we talk about the, the, the child's first school being at home with his mother. And you know what you're talking about, the, those relationship building, that building of respect. You know, I can have firsthand experience of this in that in my eldest daughter's school, there is absolutely no respect at all for teachers. It's the majority of children. The impression I get speaking to my daughter is very, very, you know, 90 plus percent of children have no respect for their teachers. Okay, there might be some teachers who are strict and therefore are able to control a class versus a, another teacher who is not so strict. But the respect element is just not there. And a, and a lot of that is because of this Western family structure that, you know, your parents are not there to give you that guidance and show you that respect that in Islam, we expect that because we, ex we respect our elders. The mother is that person who gives that guidance and the father, obviously, but the mother is the one that has the most influence. And in these societies, when the mothers are all out working as well and not being able to look, you know, give that guidance to the children, it's problematic. But while saying that, it's not a case of saying the mother should be, shouldn't be educated. Because if we understand this concept of, and you know, you're in a better situation to, to highlight this, Daniel, but that having an educated mother who can give that initial guidance to children is critical. So those people who assume that Muslims want the mothers always to be at home only, but then not be educated, how does this concept of you know, the child's initial teachings, upbringings and education being the mother even fit in. Islam, and we see from historically, we still see that, you know, academia, you know, universities, all of these things, many women were involved in this. And I think this Western structure has created some of the, the problems we see in our children. And maybe we should reflect on that in these times. I agree with you that uh, a lot of problems are coming from a lead of the West, just, um, you know, without question. But um, when we say that women should be educated, what do we mean by that? Mm. I mean, this is a big question because um, if we mean that, um, because if there isn't a response, like you're saying that the reason for this is for the purposes of children and being a positive influence on a child early in life. And that's why we have to, so does a, you know, that mother need to know, uh, have an engineering degree or does she need to have like a, uh, you know, some of these liberal arts degrees or any kind of vocational degree to be able to have that positive influence? Obviously not, no. <laughs> obviously not. So then what, what is really the benefit of education? Um, the way that I explain it is that education, the concept of education itself is a Western term. It's coming from a certain philosophy of improving humanity. Uh, mm. The Enlightenment thinkers within Britain and France and Germany within the 18th and 19th century said that we have to improve the state of society. We have to educate people, the poor, especially because these poor are uncivil and they're uncouth and they don't understand the finer things they don't under, they don't have class they don't have culture uh they they don't know the great um artists the great works of literature they have to be educated they have to learn the sciences um so that they can reach our level and so a public education program was born out of the enlightenment and it's evolved and developed over the centuries but um, this was their idea. 
uh, of what education consists of. When we look at it as Muslims, we have to recognize these components. There's a, there's a cultural component, mm -hmm. like the literature, the art, do you have the finer tastes of the aristocracy, uh, aristocracy? Or, so that's the cultural component. And then there's the vocational component. Mm -hmm. The vocational component, we can agree, has great utility because people need to work. People need to be able to go and provide for their families. Um, and, and so that's something that is excusable or can be pursued. But in Islam, who has the responsibility for uh, making ends meet, putting food on the table, providing for the family? Who has that responsibility? It's men. Men. Men have that. Women don't, don't have that responsibility um, for providing. So then what, uh, if they don't need the vocational component of education, then what about the cultural component, like reading Shakespeare and, and knowing about, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever works of art and uh, society and what have you. So is that really something that is a Muslim would need anyway? I mean, if you're bought into this idea that is pushed in the in the UK of British values, then you you do think that yeah, we want Muslims to yeah. be reading our authors, our works of art to be uh, assimilated and enculturated. So if you think that's a, that's a good idea, then yeah, by all means, uh, send your uh, your whole family. Uh, to become uh, anglicized <laughs> but uh, if we analyze education as having these kinds of two components then I mean I am of the belief that okay is there really a case that women should get educated in this sense um, at the, the average man what is the education of the average man in general if we just look at that one sex um, people just know as much as they need to know to, to work and to put food on the table. Most of what I, when I was in the corporate world working, most of what I was using day to day, very little of it actually came from my public schooling <laughs> education. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't actually most the 12 years in public school, grade school. And then even a lot of what I learned in college was not vocational in nature. It was just other things that I happen to be interested in because I'm more academic and I want to do research and all that, but it didn't contribute to, to my bottom line of providing food for my family, having an income uh, and all that. So how important is education? Like we don't have that same fundamental concept that the enlightenment thinkers had that education is going to bring utopia. And if once these uh, lower classes get some, education and some socialization then we're going to achieve utopia no as muslims we don't have any of that philosophy our philosophy is that we have to have the obligatory aspects of knowledge to be able to worship allah to know who allah is to have the to understand what uh, being a believing muslim entails in terms of belief in allah the angels the books the messengers um, and the Akhira, Yom al Qiyamah, and uh, Qadr. We have to know how to pray, we have to know how to make Tahara, we have to know how to fast, we have to know how to pay Zakat, all of these pillars of Aqidah, pillars of Islam. And we have to know how to purify our hearts. The, these are the things we have to know the diseases of the hearts. These are the things that will rectify. Mm -hmm. These are the things that the Prophet was teaching to rectify, to rectify uh, the uh, Arabs and everyone else in the world, correct? And that led to the best generation, that led to the best people, that led to the most uh, prospering that uh, the Ummah has ever seen is through those teachings. Mm. Okay? So suppose. that's our formula. That's our, so when it comes to educating our, our, our community, our women, our boys and girls, this is, that should be the pillar mm. of it, that, those suppose. teachings. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, my, even my comment was around that level of education to be able to give that Islam to your children. And you're right, that we shouldn't probably call that education because education itself today is tainted by that Western way of viewing it, meaning that you have to be educated to the level of having a job in this society. You're right, ed education from the point of view of the basic knowledge that every person really should have, not just the mother, but the father as well, in order to pass that on to their children. I think, yeah, I, yeah. I think I sort of understood that from what you said, but I think Maybe I didn't you know, make it very clear. <laughs> no, but it's, it's good though, because like if you're saying education, 
you know, it sounds like, look, our women are not educated. Then, yeah. you know, it w- Swan can take the fact that it means that they need to go and they, they have to have these degrees and so on. And it's really important because, you know, when we're talking about the time when we have with our children our people are saying, make the most of it. When you're talking about an Islamic point of view, if you don't understand the fundamentals of your deen yourself, if you don't have that, how can you pass it on? But there's also another thing, uh, uh, Brother Daniel, that I want to add to this as well is that there's, there's one advantage, and especially at this current time, that I've seen because of what's going on, i.e. in regards to this lockdown, okay? And that advantage is, and this is going to be the same over the pond, I'm sure it's the same in America, but what we've seen is the issue to do with this aggressive liberalism we've seen in schools where, you know, um, open recently, there was actually the first case in Britain where a father was looking at a jail sentence because of taking his child out of the school uh, well, actually, not even out of the school, out of the lessons to which promote LGBTQ, which promote gender fluidity, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, one advantage may well be the fact that now uh, the children are not in that environment. So, you know, and it actually go links to the first point because a lot of parents they you know were complaining in regards to what the schools are doing, and they're willing to petition and demonstrate and so on but now that your children are with you the reality is is that if our emphasis on life is our goal in life is to make sure that we provide a house to our children that we make sure they get the latest playstation game that they wear the best clothes they wear the best shoes for this we need to work without if we're working all the time then we're not learning our dean so even this time when we are with them okay you can't really take advantage and give them them fundamentals that when they do go out in this in society, when they do come across these ideas, that they're able to, you know, deal with these issues in a way which is suitable according to Islam. So, you know, in regards to the issue of LGBTQ gender fluidity and stuff like, that, what advice do you have um, in regards to you know the best way of for for parents to make most of the time in regards to undoing or or setting up these 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 barriers and this buffer zone, this guard for their children who are then going to come across this education because this is now something which most likely is going to, is going to be mandatory in 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 most of the in Western societies in the schools. So a lot. How would you? What advice would you give to parents in regards to this issue of LGBTQ feminism? Uh, <laughs> you know all this stuff. Well. <laughs> The parents have to educate themselves first, mm-hmm. uh, and otherwise they won't know like what to say. So, I, I mean, this is why I have all this material that I put out and courses, so parents can take advantage of those resources and figure out for themselves. Like, well, what do you say uh, when your child comes to you and says that? Well, I don't see why. Why should I obey? Allah, why? Well, yeah. mm. That's not. Isn't that like a dictator that I just have to obey, and I can't like opt out of obedience to Allah? That doesn't seem fair. So mm. how are you gonna address that question? How are you going to address uh, why do women wear hijab and not men? Um, all of these kinds of issues. Um, there, it's definitely on the minds of the children. So. Uh, having answers to that as a parent is is very crucial. How are you going to raise your child as a Muslim and not be able to have some thoughts to share, some ideas to convey? And that goes back to the whole point we made about co- uh, communication and connection, having that good relationship, because you want your child to trust you yeah. and trust your opinion. So if your child recognizes that, oh, my dad is not on board or my mom is not on board with this LGBT agenda, just by that trust alone that will have a very positive effect in yeah. him or her not having uh not falling for that ideology as for what can you say like on these issues um a lot could be said a lot can be uh discussed but i mean we have limited time so we can't get into everything i think i think w- one thing that's uh, affected a lot of muslims is the fact that you know this mentality where you have the man of god and you have the man of the world I this clergy mentality, I, as long as we have imams and scholars, 
who are doing what they're doing, it's not a responsibility on us as individuals to, to know this. And the reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he addresses mankind, when he addresses people in the, in the Quran, he's not addressing scholars, he's addressing human beings. And there's certain things which, you know, you mentioned quite a few of them. As Muslims, there are certain things that we need to know by necessity. These, these are things which you can't plead ignorance about because you are working too hard and stuff like this. These are things as Muslims, we need to know. But don't you, wouldn't you agree that what confuses things, okay, is that when you people have this mentality of just following someone because it's a scholar, following someone because it's an imam. So when you have people who are now in the not not I want to say pro LGBT or feminism but but they are uh, standing by them because of minorities and, and, and stuff like this like in America for example and I know you're very familiar with some of this this discourse that's going on there. Don't you think that confuses people that here we have a, a reputable person, you know, as an example someone like Omar Suleiman, okay? Um Someone who is a reputable person, he's built up, uh, you know, over the years, he's, he's built up credibility within parts of, of, of the Ummah. He, he has a following. Now, when he is uh, showing, when he is giving these views about, you know, that, that we should stand up um, for people's rights, no matter what they are, etc., etc. Now, don't you think that confuses and muddies the water? Yeah, of course. Constant confusion. Um... And I think that it is important, like there, it, it's true that not everyone can know every detail of every issue and what is the best way to address LGBT. Like a parent is not necessarily going to have the tools or the knowledge to be able to do that, but at least that parent should be able to outsource it or to say, oh, well, watch this video or take this class and so you'll fun. get authentic knowledge on this. Yeah. I think that's uh, very important. It's just a question of, who are you taking your knowledge from and who do you take as a religious authority? Many of the people who are considered to be scholars, um, they're not actually scholars. They're barely students of knowledge. Um, and they don't have, even though they are called Sheikh, they're not, uh, where's that title coming from? Mm. Where's that title coming from? Who is, it's, who is being, uh, granted these titles and on what basis because some of the people who are the most prominent in terms of social media following are not actually very knowledgeable and then you do have knowledgeable people who they have studied they have the credentials but they're still promoting very wrong ideas mm. there's they're promoting very wrong ideas and those are the ones who are the most dangerous uh, because they have the knowledge and they're distorting it and Honestly, the way that you can tell is that it's good to have a broad basis of who you follow. Like this is the advice that I give the average Muslim. Like, okay, you're on social media or YouTube, you're consuming this content, but don't tie your religion to one personality, like to one individual that you don't even know personally. You've only seen him through uh, a YouTube video. If it's someone that you know personally, like a masjid, um, you'll have more of a close relationship with that person by virtue of that's the imam at the masjid and you're studying from him. But in general, have a wide variety of teachers, have a broad basis of teachers, because when you have a broad basis, then you can understand, okay, what's within the bounds of acceptability Islamically. And you'll truly benefit from that. And that's the advice that my teachers would give me is, is saying that my teacher, one of my teachers would say that I've really benefited from having a, a diversity of teachers, uh, strong Sunni Muslim teachers, obviously, on their tradition. Um, but they're just like different madhahib, um, diff different from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so he benefited from that. And he recommend like you as well, like make sure that you have like a broad basis. And then when it comes to online, uh, you can tell like if you ha are following reliable people and, and a, a, a variety of them, then it becomes obvious who's saying something that is really out there and is not in line with the Islamic tradition. And it's something shev, it's, it's something, um, you know, uh, weird that he is promoting. Um, 
So that's my advice, like practically, because the, it's a chicken or egg problem. I don't have the knowledge. How do I get the knowledge? Mm -hmm. And how do I know who is knowledgeable to get the knowledge from if I don't have the knowledge? Exactly. So which, which comes first, chicken or the egg? So the solution to that is have a wide uh, range of people that you are following and then evaluate. And you're going to have a well-rounded understanding of some of these Islamic issues uh, through that. And if you can take organized courses and be regular, uh, if you can't do that in person uh, because of COVID or whatever else, just follow online and, and train yourself. Like you, if you are so concerned about your children and conveying the right knowledge to your children, if that's really a priority for you, then what effort are you making uh, to do that? You know, I gave, no, that's, I think that's very, really, really important advice. I give something similar to a few brothers recently where, again, you know, there were, the question was similar in that sometimes you can view some content and my, my answer to whether this content was correct or not was a little bit like sometimes there'll be someone speaking, try to take what is good and leave what is bad. But obviously, that's a bit of too much of a general statement. So they were like, how do I know what is good and what is bad? So that my answer was that, you know, if you have a broader range of knowledge or you have a broader range of sources, which include some of the classical sources, then you can evaluate a little bit better rather than I think what you get nowadays is people follow one particular personality in a very and it's called personality as well for a reason because you have a very personal attachment to that person as soon as someone says anything not negative but even if they say that what that person is saying is incorrect in a polite way you take it to heart rather than taking it personally you should you should evaluate you should check whether you know we're human beings they're human beings at the end of the day they're they're not infallible so i think that's important um can i also yeah. say uh, this might be a controversial view but i'll put it out there is you know uh, this aggressive liberalism that you asked the question majid about okay i i think an element of it we could see as a bit of a i don't know if positive is the right word but it's having a it's causing a clash whereas you know historically um what we've had is these countries, these Western countries that we live in, they let us pray, they let us fast, they let us have our masajid, they let us practice our deen, such that we've become comfortable here. Whereas now, because of this aggressive liberalism, those people who people may have even called Uncle Toms and given them kind of negative names, even some of those people who are very pro-West, pro-government, or now when it comes to LGBT, when it comes to these kind of things, are suddenly realizing, wait there a minute, they want to corrupt my children with falsehood. I'm not happy about it. So maybe this aggressive liberalism is uh, something that is waking Muslims up, which that wake up call is required. Yeah, but, it's uh, some... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Manch. And I was, I was just going to say that, and this is why I think that... Uh, when you have scholars coming out or so-called scholars that are then legitimizing this, you see the problem. You see how why so you see why it's so dangerous because people are agitated, but then you know they're looking and, and like Daniel said, if they don't go to the right source, then this will just appease them. Yeah, exactly. So, is it like a positive that? I mean, it's <laughs> positive is probably the wrong word, but you know, it's, it's causing a bit of a stigma, which is hopefully waking people up. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you need a uh, jolt to be woken up and that's the nature of liberalism is that it's going to continue to push and push and push. I mean, we're in the throes of it right now. Like this is a liberal project to lock everyone down. Uh, you're lock, locking everyone down for their safety. And so this is maximizing people's liberty because it's protecting us all from death, certain death that will millions and billions will die if, uh, if we are going to the grocery store or we're praying Jumu at the masjid. So this is the liberal project that we're experiencing. And it could get to the extent where everyone is uh, trapped, like in certain uh, metropolitan areas, urban areas, there's limited space, like in East Asia, Southeast Asia, Japan. So what if we could just contain everyone in a, in a box, like everyone's locked down, and then psychological problems will erupt 
because of this. So we just True. give everyone a, a certain kind of drug, mm -hmm. uh, a certain kind of soma, like in Brave New World, to just ease them, make them feel this euphoria, mm -hmm. and you know, provide for them their food uh, on a daily basis. And then this is like ultimate freedom. This is ultimate, like everyone's experiencing maximum pleasure, mm -hmm. bodily pleasure, uh, every single day. There's no toil, there's no work, there's no, this is a utopia. That's the, that's the liberal utopia, and that's what we're slowly uh, closing in on. And this was just the next step, this lockdown. So we're going to see what's going to happen, what's going to come away from it. But uh, hopefully, unfortunately, not everyone has woken up uh, with even this. Like me, we're skeptical. We're talking about this as like a bad thing, this lockdown. But a lot of Muslims, sadly, I haven't seen them woke up woken up they think that okay this is we have to do this and there's no problem with it let's mm. just close all the masajid let's close the haram let's let's wrap everything up no problem you know and, and with no resistance no resistance to it you know there was one point uh and and this might be like uh over the top but i've i've been i've been thinking about this and, and when you got daniel on and you got rash on and you know i have, I have to bring my theory my uh, hardcore theory across but <laughs> I, I i was thinking that you know especially in the UK, you know, the first week when Juma was, the Juma uh, mosques were closed for Juma, what you saw is this outpour of emotion. A lot of people were texting. I can't believe this. I didn't think I expected this to happen in my lifetime, etc., etc. Right. Then what I gauged was, you know, the week after there wasn't that much. And then I was, I was thinking that, you know, so imagine this goes on for six months. Mm. Imagine that after six months, you know, I don't think it'd ever be like this, but, you know that same emotion should be, should be consistent, right? But when it, this becomes normal, as an example, when it becomes normal and like you know, you never know, uh, Juma could become an inconvenience in six months' time, and you got to go and pray again on Friday. But I'll, you know, it won't be like that. But I was just thinking, like, look, look how humans are in the sense, like you know, when a situation changes after a bit, it just becomes normal, you know. And, and that's just one example that I personally experienced. And I was, I, I didn't my mind and I thought I'd share it out because, you know, there's been justification of it. There's been justification mm -hmm. of this, exactly what you're talking about. Do you know how they're saying that uh, I'm not going to mention the, the scholar who said this online, <laughs> he has a social media presence, but he said that, look, this is, we're practicing Islam uh, as the Sahaba practiced it in the early days, the beginning of uh, Islam in Mecca, where they had to hide and they had to be in their homes and so, right? oh, so this is, so this is Meccan Islam. We're experiencing Islam like the Sahaba, like the Sahaba were at the beginning. So he's like spinning it as if this mm. is a good thing yeah. that everything is being shut down, that Muslims aren't able to practice. And this is exactly what uh, modernists have been doing for a long time. They've said that look, we don't need to establish khalif uh, khilafa. We don't need to uh, have any kind of governance by the Sharia. We don't need to have any of it because we are practicing Meccan Islam, Islam mm. as it was practiced in Mecca. So just pray, just, you know, do your salah, maybe have salat al jumma pay your zakat. But these other aspects of Islam are not applicable. They're not relevant to our day and age. So now we're getting to a day and age where even praying in the masjid is not relevant or is not necessary or is not safe or some other excuse. And we have to go back to when Islam is just in the, Bro, the like, and they think it is a good thing, man. The scary thing is, you know, hopefully they don't come out with a fatwa that you need to go before Islam was... Uh, uh, reveal. <laughs> <laughs> reveal but, but you know that's well, a, that, <laughs> but that's a good point, bro. Because if you think about it, you know, for example, as Muslims, and I want to make this point earlier. You know, when we talk about who, which scholar can we go to, and which scholar and stuff like, you, you're right. There are certain people that are qualified to make ishtihad and stuff like this, right? Not everyone can do it. But you know, if someone was to just put effort and read the sira as an example, if they were to read the the Quran to a certain degree, look at some tafsir. You know, I'm not even talking about going into it in too much detail. Just, just reading it, you would see that the whole life of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the and the yeah. pre, the, pre, the pious predecessors after was for a certain objective. Now, when you have these people that are, are, are giving these fatawas, then you would actually see uh, you would see a contradiction. And and if somebody was to look at the the seerah and look at how the Muslims lived and how they established Islam in Medina and how it spread and and how they liberated mankind. You know, this issue to do with the Jummah, and I just, you know, as Brother Daniel mentioned about the, the Khilafah there, and the Sharia, and I just thought that actually, you know what, 
the, the, just say, you know, it's all, some people may argue it's been 200 years or it's been 100 years since the Khilaf has not been here near Sharia. But you know, the same way that maybe that desire is, is not there in the normal person to be living under this, to be working towards this. In the same way, with the Juma example, the, the first, the fact that there was that emotional, and then you have the, the people coming out saying, you know, you're going into your Meccan stage, so you must go, go home. What you have is you have same you have people out there who are reputable and you know um, online scholars and who have a huge following, millions of following. When they say that Khilafah is not needed, the Sharia is not needed, Islam was not secular, priority. yeah, is not a priority. Then you mm. can see why that there isn't going to be that that same feeling. And and one last, one quick point as well is that what I noticed is. You know, when you speak to many people and you speak to them about the problems of the ummah, you speak to them about the sharia, you speak to them about, about other khilafa, other things. A lot of people, what they do is they say, brother, make dua. Okay, fair enough. Alhamdulillah, you need dua as the weapon of a believer. But what we've seen since this coronavirus thing is the amount of messages about dua, the amount of like um, coordinated world duas. I synchronized duas that on this day, on this particular time, worldwide, we're going to do a du'a for coronavirus and the removing, right? And you're thinking, actually, if that's what it means to make du'a, then even the people who say make du'a for the return of Sharia, the, the, the return of Khilafah, even their du'a is half-hearted because w- when do we see these huge appeals in the masajid or in the or online to say, let's make a let's make a uh, a, uh, a comprehensive du'a, let's make you know for the return of Islam, for the return of this and that. But you don't see that, and 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 that's why I think. What's scary is maybe something which absolves a lot of the, the normal people from this is that if the scholars are not speaking about this, if people are hesitant to speak about it, then the normal person isn't going to know. And on the, other, on the other hand, if you have got people who are saying, look, we're in the Meccan phase now, we're doing what the Sahaba did, then it's legitimizing it. And, and you know, six months without Jummah, just say now you come back out, that same emotional attachment, is it going to be there? Allah wa I don't know. But but I do think that the, the responsibility of the, the scholars and the people with the knowledge, if they're not directing the people in the right way, then there are certain things where, that people are not going to know about. They're not going to find it as relevant. They're not going to find it as a priority. And then the problems that we see today are just going to continue, continue. And who's to blame? Is it, is it the people that's giving these, these, these verdicts and these fatwas? I think a lot of scholars are doing fine and they're... Uh, promoting exactly what you're mentioning uh, when it comes to certain social media celebrities I mean whatever like they've already discredited them discredited themselves mm. uh, for those who know and who have like even a little bit of knowledge they've they're already discredited and their following should not be taken as something like they are actually uh, representative of scholarship or all that amount. this is a mistake that people make like I me you others might be disappointed with uh, some of these celebrity figures because of the kinds of compromises that they've made and the kinds of uh, uh, interests that they've belied. But they're not representative of Ulama as a whole. A lot of Ulama I know personally, and some of them are my teachers, they're working very hard and they're saying the right thing, they're teaching the right thing, they're working in the right way. So I don't want to group them all, <laughs> paint mm. them all with the same brush. Mm, of course. We have to be ca- careful about that. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is that the people that are speaking the truth, they're not going to be given the prime time TV slots. And, uh, you know, but one thing is, though, to be honest with you, in America, still, alhamdulillah, here, yeah, there's things that people are saying in America, which in the UK, you know, like a lot of the stuff to do with like LGBT and stuff like that. You won't find any any ulama, imams and stuff like that would, who would support this in the same way it's been done in America. Um, well, because... in the UK, in the UK, you had actual uh, protests, right? Because of yeah. the, we didn't have that in the US. Mm. Even though the same thing has happened here, the curriculum, the primary school curriculum mm. has been changed in many parts of the country. Um, I didn't see any Muslims here protesting, unfortunately, even though I was hoping to see that. Uh, but it didn't happen. It happened with uh, you brothers over there. Mm. So a lot of the mosques and the committees and stuff are discussing that even if it's not in the open there are a lot of mosque committees that are discussing you know how do we now overcome these barriers because and, and that's probably what i was trying to mention earlier on as well the one of the positives has been is 
again, a lot of the Muslims here are from Asian subcontinent type environment. So historically, the mosque was very much just a place to go and learn Quran and mm. pretty much and, and Salah. Whereas now there's an appreciation and a realization that we also need to use the mosque to undo some of these teachings, these incorrect teachings that are happening in the school. But then that's important and it's alhamdulillah that's happening or that's in the process of happening. How much they allow that, that's going to be a difficult one because I'm sure there are some mosques have tried it already and had had some issues. So I know there's going to be some problems, but alhamdulillah, at least that there's the effort that is happening. Um, the way for me to look at it, though, is I think it's always going to be difficult in these kind of societies. And that's where I think as Muslims, the sad thing is sometimes, especially with all this COVID situation, is there's a lot of non-Muslims coming out and questioning capitalism. You know, even on the media, on mainstream media, there are people being given airtime to question capitalism and say, you know, look at the way that um, China have dealt with this situation or look at, forget China, look at the way South Korea have dealt with this situation. You know, they're putting the lives of elderly at a level where they at least want to test a lot of people and look after them. And look at these Western nations, they're pretty much speaking as if the elderly and those with health conditions are completely disposable, which we know that is from capitalism anyway, but it's very obvious and apparent by the policies of the Western countries. So non-Muslims are actually questioning this somewhat, this capitalist framework. And, um, but unfortunately then they're promoting an element of socialism or uh, solutions from the other side. Whereas actually it should be Muslims, I think, who should be at the forefront of this and saying Islam provides solutions which looks after human beings in the way they should be looked after and also equally doesn't treat them like you know disposable like in a, a capitalist environment and that should be coming from muslims presenting that alternative and saying allah sharia when it's implemented provides us with this yeah i agree i think that muslims need to be at the forefront of all of these issues now as is a crisis period and that is a period where people are questioning their previous frames of thought where they were lulled into a sense of complacency because of a system that uh, was seemingly stable, seemingly built on solid foundations. Now that that illusion, that mirage has been, they've been disabused of that. Now they're, they're, there's opportunity for them to uh, see an alternative and see it with positive or more appreciative eyes, uh, or at least to consider it. So. I think Muslims have a big opportunity to be speak very strongly, speak very with wisdom, speak uh, in a way that shows that, look, we have something that is completely an alternative. Look at where this system has taken you. <laughs> look at where it's ending up. Um, if, it's, if it's taking you here, that tells you that was actually, if this is the fruit of the tree, that tells you that the tree was rotten or was uh, harmful at the core. So we need to look at this alternative. And then Muslims can speak about Islam without constantly referring back and making it seem like, oh, Islam is just like what you know. Islam is just, uh, has all of the same values that you're used to. We're, we, we're just as pro-feminist. We're just as pro-freedom and pro-democracy and pro-British values or pro-American values. Hopefully now we can get out of that frame of inferiority and say that, no, this is actually a clear, a clean alternative uh, a, a, that is separate and apart from what you've been practicing. And it has these clear advantages and that's because it's coming from the creator of all of humankind. So I agree with you completely. This is prime opportunity for that, those kinds of discussions with our classmates, friends, family, and so forth. SubhanAllah. I think uh, the only thing that sometimes can be a bit difficult is um, when you point out to solutions that are maybe not in existence in the sense like, you know, if, if, if we were to say that, you know, Islam uh, has the solutions to all the life's problems, uh, you know, if there's a, if there's a living model in place, it's a bit easier to point to it and say, look, this is how we, we dealt with it. I mean, just some examples of some Muslim countries like Turkey, you know, uh, in the sense like, you know, it's not implemented the Sharia, but there's certain values that are within the people that they're being lauded about. Look, this is how they were able to deal with this issue. Whilst in the West, you know, in a way, 
they, they, they take an opportunity to say, look, let's take a certain aspect of the population, which is actually a burden on the, on the economy and society. Let's remove them through this thing. You know, anyone who's, they've said this, anyone who's 65 or 70, basically they're not going to be given a bed or a ventilator, etc. So I think what it is, is, you know, first and foremost, uh, you can show this and, and, and what my, my opinion is, is that we can point this out to non-Muslims because you're right, Rush. They're the ones that are asking and unfortunately, the problem is it should be Muslims that are asking. So maybe, you know, our emphasis should really be on the Muslims who should know this, who should be pointing this out. The fact that, look, you know, you're smitten by the Western culture. You know, you think you've made it because you're here, but look, the reality is, is we're Muslims. This is how we should be living our life, etc., etc. Obviously, this comes through contacting people, through culturing. But you're right. This is, you know, this is a, an important moment, um, both for Muslims and non-Muslims. And I personally do believe that non-Muslims, they do want change. Uh, the normal person, the normal person who is being, you know, their blood is being sucked by this system. They are, they do want change, but there's no alternative to, to them. You know, if you present an alternative, which isn't there, they'll say, look, look at your lens. There's so many problems there. How can you be, you know, giving me this solution when you're not, your people are not even applying it on themselves. So alhamdulillah, obviously it just goes to show that we are responsibility to the Muslims, but also we have responsibility to mankind in general, you know, and we need to get our house in order. Otherwise we can't really get the world in order because you know, we have to work on, on our, on the ummah first, isn't it? Yeah, that's a very important point <laughs> that uh, it's the opportunity to educate Muslims now mm. that, okay, this, uh, don't be smitten with this system. Uh, don't uh, bow to this system that's collapsing in front of you. Sure. You should wake up and recognize the reality of what is truly going to lead to uh, prosperity in this life and the next. SubhanAllah. So, I mean, it's getting, um, towards Maghrib time here in the UK. Um, so, you know, slowly bringing things to, to a close. So, so brother Daniel, what's your forecast for Ramadan? Tarawi or no Tarawi? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, I don't know. And this Ramadan, there's might be instead of debates about the number of rak'at, there's going to be debates on whether to even go to the masjid or not. SubhanAllah. Uh, yeah, and, that's right. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. That's going to be the most heartbreaking thing, I think. You know, like you say, that unity, brotherhood that comes from standing shoulder to shoulder with people reading Tarawih and that environment. And no matter how hard you try, there's going to be, it's impossible to create that environment at home. You know, you know, absolutely. You know, one thing though, as well, is that I'm probably we didn't mention about it is that, you know, you know also there's, there's things that Muslims here in the West we're seeing as inconvenience now. We're seeing, you know, just because we can't leave our homes. We feel like you know our life has become really awful, but when you think about when you add perspective into it, and you think about what the ummah is actually experiencing all over the world, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and we're not experiencing, I wouldn't say not even one percent of that. You understand? Know, I think it, it should should hit home as well, and and the issue to do with the Jumma and the Tarawi and stuff like this, you know, I think this is something which, yeah, there will be there will be issues of uh, whether there should be a Tarawi, whether there shouldn't be a Tarawi. Uh, but, you know, as Muslims, I think this is an opportunity, to, if there isn't a Tarawi, I think to, to, to speak to people. And I, I would also say that uh, try to, you know, big, give the bigger picture. For example, Juma. There's some scholars, um, I think it's from the Hanafi fiqh, uh, Brother Daniel, maybe you have to correct me. They, they believe that um, without just say a Khalifa, that Juma is not even valid as an example, right? So... If if we were heartbroken because we missed one Jummah or two Jummahs or three Jummahs, then for, for from the point of view of it's been almost a century now since you haven't had a certain authority there, then this should be something which hits home and actually thinks, you know what, Islam is bigger than just me and uh, some rituals. It's to do with, you know, it's a deen. It's not a religion. It's a deen. You know, the way we're taught in school that this is one of the three Abrahamic religions and we're put on the, on the same level as, as all these other religions. No, Islam is a deen. So, you know, alhamdulillah, maybe is one of those moments where we will be able to speak to people um, and try to, try to bring that home. It will be weird, obviously, not no tarawi, but um, if people at home, then, you know, we have opportunities like to bring uh, another opportunity to bring mm -hmm. Brother Daniel back on, maybe, you know, and, uh, and bring up yeah, the... Sure. 
you know, the, we, these issues? Well, we don't know. Like, inshallah, the message will be open mm. in a month and things will be better. Inshallah. You know, we can make dua for that, that um, we have that opportunity. And it'd be, yeah, it'd be very sad if we can't. Like, it's already bad enough. Like, mm. this has been two weeks now, like, no Juma. Yeah. No, uh, you know, going to the masjid for jama'ah, like, can't do it. Um, mm. So, and and even if you, in some places I heard that they're sneaking um, mm. in the U.S., really? they're like sneaking for uh, prayers and uh, going to, mm. for jama'ah. But it's kind of a sensitive issue mm. because even the Muslim community is, some within the Muslim community will report yeah. if you're going to the masjid or you're going to the masjid and you're like praying uh, shoulder to shoulder as opposed to having like uh six feet separation then you can the muslims could report you to authorities so. well, brother daniel i've got a quick question for you and this is a quick question because we're running out of time here and actually it's linked to you what your original view is on the covid19 right yeah the hadiths that people are using you know um is are to do with plague yeah yeah plague Ta-ta-ng. Right, so so the, so really, it goes back to your original point: the fact that if this thing is being exaggerated, it's not really a plague, is it? You understand? But if you're if if the mindset is that, because I know people from family actually who originally their mindset was if they leave the, if they go outside, they will catch COVID nineteen through the air, and and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being honest there, right? So because of this paranoia, you have these people who are then okay, don't look. It makes sense that we can't. Uh, put ourselves in danger and other people in danger, but then if we're linking it to the hadiths and and obviously you know the Arabic word for the for for plague and stuff, would you um, say that would you say that what we're seeing now is 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 the same as what's mentioned in those hadith? So um, there's when it comes to what is ta'un, there's two opinions. So it could refer to a very specific thing, like a very specific plague. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was referring to a specific thing as opposed to just general disease, mass okay. disease. So uh, there are different scholars who took the view that it's like uh, Imam Nawawi or Ibn Hajar, that it's only referring to a specific thing, hmm. like a specific disease. I think that I causes boils exactly. and yeah, leprosy somewhere, yeah. Yeah, so that's one opinion. The other opinion says that, no, it's, it's more general than that. Mm. So that's one consideration. The other consideration is, well, what are the numbers actually? And has it reached the level? Because if it's just the flu, then the flu comes and goes every year. There's a flu season. And that's not considered a plague. So there's both factors there that have to be con- taken into consideration. Mm. And, you know, more knowledgeable scholars have written in-depth answers to this question, actually. So okay. within the U.S., within the U.S., it's in Arabic. Um, I don't know if it's been translated, but uh, Sheikh Salah Sawi, uh, who is based in uh, Texas, actually, he has written their, um, you know, he, he's written his response on on this issue, and so that's a reference. And he makes the distinction between ta'un and just general sickness. But um, yeah, it's a good question to ask. Because uh, uh, you know. Uh... Very quickly, because Rush, uh, we, me and Rush, we in this group, a uh, brother posed a question. And uh, he's basically said, is a hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that um, Medina is protected by plague. And so his question was... From plague, yeah. From plague. So his question was, is that there's people within uh, Medina who are being reported as, as, as having COVID-19, I think maybe even dying from COVID-19. So mm. he was a bit confused. And, and, and the angle that we sort of discussed was the fact that, you know, a plague, is this really a plague? When you think of the Black Plague and you think of a plague, is this really a plague? So it was down that same route, but it was good to get your opinion on that. And I'll look into that a bit more, to be honest with you, inshallah um, yeah. So yeah, so I, I think we should sort of bring this bring this to a close. I mean, any, any final points, uh, Brother Daniel, Brother Rush? I'll start with Brother Daniel. <laughs> no final points. Uh, just try not to go crazy. <laughs> indoors and tries to spend time with family uh and maybe less time on the phone less time on whatsapp and tv and mm-hmm. so it's an opportunity you know if uh, allah has given you t- some free time uh try to improve yourself maybe you know memorize some quran 
read Quran um, both in Arabic and then if you don't know Arabic, read it in English so that you will get some meaning out of it. And there's going to be barakah either way. But uh, we have to reconnect with Allah's book in these times because the, the guidance that we need can only come from uh, what Allah has sent in his revelation. So that's my number one recommendation for lockdown. Lockdown, subhanAllah. Rush? Yeah, I would say, I think a person, I'll give some personal experience very quickly, is the type of discussions I'm trying to have. And again, this depends on the age of your children is, and I think all parents should have this, you know, about how to prove God, how to prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to prove a creator, have those discussions with your children, because those are the type of discussions that, you know, they might have in schools and present a very atheistic point of view. So this time, you know, you can have those discussions with your children and, and don't, in other words, don't just because they're young, don't assume that they're going to struggle with the concept. However young they are, you can package that in the right way and have that discussion. So in terms of the what people you're speaking to in your home, your family, I would say those kind of discussions and speaking about the dean is very important, as Brother Daniel said. But equally, I think, and I said this to you, Brother Majid, in that our little live Instagram live that we had the other day, was don't make this a, an isolated thing. Well, just as we've got these kind of technologies, doesn't mean you can't have a, a Skype call or a Zoom call or something with other people and do dawah still. Just because you're stuck at home doesn't mean you can only give dawah to your family. Of course, that, that is a priority as well. But use this time as an opportunity to speak to people that you've lost touch with. You know, and, and I think this is a great opportunity to do that. We should see it as a blessing. SubhanAllah, the Messenger وسلم, said, you know, take advantage of the five over the five. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that I used to speak to anyway, uh, whatever profession they are in, they were always too busy. Bro, listen, I really agree with you and I really want to know more or I want to do this. But listen, I go to work, I come home, I chill the children and then that's my life. Okay, that's fine then. So I'm not saying they were making excuses. That's just reality. But now you do, now your reality, reality has changed. So now, you, you know, there's no excuses. Time. So, uh, mm. so yeah, so Jazakallah Her guys, really uh, uh, for joining me on this podcast. Uh, Jazakallah Her for Brother Daniel. Uh, once again, to come on to the uh, Talking Dean podcast really is a pleasure. And inshallah, hopefully we will uh, you know, try to uh, get another slot with you, maybe in Ramadan. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's loads to speak about. And also to my co-host, Brother Rash. Jazakallah uh, to you as well. And uh, for all our listeners and, um, and people watching this, uh, really, uh, there's some strong messages here today. And uh, it's time to reflect. You know, we, we, we may be in a situation we're not used to. Um, and as Allah says, you know, you know, he tests people so they return back to him. And if we don't take heed and continue as we are, even in the current reality and the situation, then when are we going to? When you know, with nine to five and the system's got a hold of you in a way where you don't have time to think about anything else. So really, inshallah, some some really brilliant uh, comments made. Um, so I hope you will benefit from this podcast. And uh, yeah, so you can you know access our material on YouTube. Please subscribe. And uh, you and subscribe on our podcast, uh, which is available on all popular podcast platforms. And we're also on Facebook and Telegram and Instagram also. Uh, so, yeah, so Jazakallah, first and foremost, to our special guest, Brother Daniel and uh, Rash. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, assalamu alaikum to all the guests, all, well, not the guests, but all the viewers and the listeners at home. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.